Hi there. I am Michael Hinkson, your host for Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. We get to do a bunch of that all the time. It's a lot of fun. Today, we get to chat with Rachel Serwitz. And Rachel worked for Goldman Sachs for a while. She has become a pretty significant person in the world of coaching and has a lot of things to say about that, talking about employment, employees, and employee hopping and other things like that, or employment hopping, I guess is better term. But we'll get to all that. Um, and I expect that we're going to have a lot of fun. So Rachel, thanks for being here and welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Yeah, thanks for having me. And we're uh, we're really glad that you're here and looking forward to the day. Well, tell us a little bit about you kind of growing up, maybe the early Rachel, if you will. Oh, yes. Let's see. <laughs> Growing a long up, time I mean, ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, I grew up on Long Island, uh, New York. And honestly, I just was working hard in school. I didn't know the direction I wanted to go in for my career. I just kind of knew like work hard and you'll probably figure it out later. Um <laughs> You know, um, I don't know if I fully knew exactly where school was going to lead, but I just figured get good grades. Someone will probably pay attention to that eventually. Um, so, yeah. And then I needed to figure out college and my dad always wanted me to be a doctor and I never really had a reason to question it. And then finally, you know, going to college was the moment where people were finally like, what is it you want to do? And I, you know, started thinking about it and realized that my previous experiences in in the health field weren't something that really drew me, you know, to it. And so I ended up going to Binghamton as an undecided major, which was mm. the best thing I could have done. And I think every student should, you know, it's funny because they are undecided and yet they have to somehow pick. And so um, I eventually picked human development, which was super broad. It was kind of like psychology, sociology, and that allowed me to just figure out what I really wanted to do. I leaned a lot into like business internships and just explored, did a lot of projects and just got involved with things on campus and tried to figure out what it is I wanted to do from there. Um, but I will pause. I could keep going through the story, <laughs> but that's kind of me up until college days. So you, uh, well, I, I know what you're saying and you, you were undecided at first. I always wanted to go into the sciences. And so I went to University of California, Irvine, and we actually went down to see the chair of the physics department between my junior and senior years in high school. And I always decided I wanted a major in physics and that's what I did. What I wasn't as strong about was exactly what I wanted to do with it, but I thought I wanted to teach and uh, I thought that we can always use good teachers. And the more I went to the university and went to a lot of classes, the more I realized we really do need good teachers because a lot of these people may know their subject very well, but teaching it is a different story. But then I had other things that that changed the career along the way. Like I got offered a, an opportunity to work for the National Federation of the Blind and Ray Kurzweil, the futurist, to had developed a machine that would read print out loud to blind people. It was his first adventure in the world of optical character recognition. And he had developed the technology that really provided Omnifont OCR to the world. And he decided his first application would be to make a machine that would read print out loud. And that eventually led to me through circumstances going into sales. So, um, I, I made sales a teaching kind of thing because I realized that the best salespeople are really teachers. So even though it wasn't directly physics, I got to teach anyway. Yeah, I love it. I mean, sometimes we, we're we getting to know ourselves and what we think we want to do and what we think we like doing. But of course, there's opportunities that arise. To me, it's a journey of, you know, yes, what comes your way, but you also want to be intentional with getting to know what you think you want to do and going to find those opportunities. But yeah, I mean, things do arise and, and we got to see like, is this in line with what I want to be doing more of? And then of course it's a yes or, or not. Right. But you know, you, you, you know, with my clients, it's, you know, we're not just leaving it up to fully chance. It's, it's what do we want and how do we go get it? But it's great that, you know, you were, you were finding opportunities come to you. Of course, that's, that's kind of ideal. Um, but it's, it's a combination, right? Who finds you and how do you also go after what it is that you want? Yeah. Oh, well, and 
Um, I also know that if we really look at our lives, we can trace everything that led us to where we are by the choices that we make. And sometimes they're good choices and sometimes they're not. And the question is, do we learn from the choices that we make <clears throat> all the way down the line? But still, it's about choice. And I, I understand what you're saying. You went into college sort of undecided. And that was probably, unless you had just a definite thought, that was probably a good idea. And I think you you said it very well. It makes a lot of sense to be willing to explore and think about what you want to do. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, any undergrad, right. They're, they're younger and they may not know yet. And so I, I like to help people really, how do you properly explore your career path? Um, and, and hope that people can do that. But even by the time you have to choose a major, it might not be enough time. Um, but using those college years wisely to really clarify your path is, is the best thing you can do. And, you know, you may or may not use your major, you know, later on in your career. But I, I think the issue I see is like when somebody chooses a major that's so specific and so far away from what it is they actually want to do. So that's where like for me, you know, I chose something very broad and that yeah. was great because I could use it in a lot of ways. Um, so that's, that's, you know, depending on the person, depending on the student, it's, it's just something to think about if you're choosing a very niche path you know, make sure you really understand it and you know what it's all about. And what is that going to really look like when you go pursue that path? What I didn't do was choose a specific branch of physics as such. But, you know, even though I ended up going in directions that didn't directly use physics, what I also realized, however, as I went through life, if you will, was I learned a lot that helped me. For example, one of the, the things that good physics teachers teach <clears throat> is you pay attention to the details. Like if you're doing a calculation, it isn't enough to get the numbers right. You have to get the units to go with it. So, for example, if you're trying to compute acceleration and you don't come out with feet per second squared or centimeters or meters per second squared, even if you come out with the right number, you've done something wrong. It's it's the whole scenario and it's very important to pay attention to all the details to make sure that you do what you really want to do. And paying attention to details became kind of a life mantra for me, and especially in and around the World Trade Center events and what happened afterwards, paying attention to details is a, a very important message I'd love to talk to people about because that saved my life on September 11th. And I can trace that back to the desire that was developed in physics. Yeah, no, I like that. It's it's true. My partner was chemical engineering and I feel like he always talks about how it's like a way of thinking and a way of problem solving. And, you know, that is a niche major. But yes, you can definitely gain, you know, ways of thinking basically from that. Um, but at the same time, you know, it it, it is still choosing a pretty specific area yeah. of study. Um, but yes, you, you can get those unintended benefits too from it. On the other hand, um, later in life, I appreciated the TV show, The Big Bang Theory. So I guess it counts for something. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So when did you graduate from college? Uh, in 2013. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And um, so at that time, had you made some decisions about what you kind of wanted to do in the world? Yeah. So I was really trying very hard to figure out what it is I wanted to do. I did a consulting internship. I did a lot of um, just other experiences and internships and projects on campus, clubs. I was dabbling in, you know, HR. Um, try I did a lot of networking with alumni. I was just trying to learn about like different things that were out yeah. there. And and then um, so Goldman came to Binghamton's campus and they were recruiting for uh, the operations department. And I honestly had never heard of operations. But when I learned about it, I was like, this really aligns with me because it's all about processes and efficiency and um, things like that. So I, I really felt aligned. Maybe that was lucky. And then because I had done so much networking, I learned how to have a professional presence that I think stood out amongst other undergrads. So I ended up interviewing there and I landed a role there and I was there for three years. 
Um, but once I landed there, you know, operations was aligned, but I was still working on essentially like cash management, treasury liquidity type functions. And I realized that I liked operational things, but I didn't love so much the financial services, you know, content of it. And so I was still, you know, I did so much effort to just figure out like, okay, I like this, but I don't like that. And what should I keep doing to learn more about what it is that I like? And actually at Goldman, I was very lucky to, you know, I got involved with projects really just by choice. So if I noticed an opportunity to, you know, people needed help to develop skills after their performance reviews. So I implemented a skill development program, or we needed help for onboarding uh, globally across our department or recruiting, or, you know, there was just a lot of different people oriented projects um, that I got involved with and I was interested in. And so lucky enough, I was able to do so much of that um, while there. And that's what really led me to my next role where I leaned more into like the people HR functions. Uh, I went to a hedge fund and I was more on the recruiting and performance management side. And so, yeah, by doing those sort of internal side projects, it helped me figure out like what role was more aligned with my interests. I also did things outside of my job. So I was actually doing volunteering career coaching through a nonprofit. Um, I, I did a lot of things just to try to do research, networking, experiential learning in order to continue to figure out like what work I wanted to do basically. Yeah. So you, you stayed at Goldman, you said for three years and, and clearly um, my observation would be you learned a lot, which is what it's all about. And maybe it wasn't what you expected uh, or maybe it was, but you learned a lot and you took a lot of knowledge and information and internalized that that helped you move on from there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it definitely gave me a lot of room to learn and grow for sure. I also had five months in India um, when I was there. So just so many amazing experiences. They had um, this sort of other competition where you could get together with other analysts and suggest a nonprofit for the firm to support. So we were able to present to senior leaders. There were so many ways to get involved. I was involved with the Women's Network. Like I just sort of took advantage of all, you know, not just my day to day job, but just getting involved with so many things that were interesting to me. So it definitely was valuable even in just those three years. Yeah. So you left Goldman in 2016 and where did you go from there? So then I went to Bridgewater, um, which is a hedge fund. Hedge fund, um, right. Yeah. And I was in recruiting and performance management to support the uh, investment associates. So sort of the front office. Uh, so perfect. now you were in a little bit more of a people oriented kind of environment or position. Yeah. The, yeah. It, I mean, you could sort of call it like HR, but we were, our team sat within the front office. So there was actually a separate HR team, but we were doing those people functions like recruiting and performance management and training and culture and employee experience. That's kind of what our team was doing uh, to support the investment department, let's say. So did the knowledge that you gained, even though you weren't a great fan of a lot of the financial aspects of it at Goldman, did a lot of the information and knowledge that you gained at Goldman help you in doing that job, though? Um, I think so. I mean, you know, I think when I went to Bridgewater, I felt like I was still having a fresh start and I learned how they did things. Um, mm -hmm. I think the most important thing that I took from Goldman was like, A learning about my interest in the people uh, space. And then also just, you know, the importance of operations. I was in the operations department. So I definitely took that away. But Bridgewater was very different because they were very oriented on like people and feedback, whereas Goldman was very oriented on operations and process. So I sort of took different things from each place. And now I try to combine those very two things. But they they operated very differently. So, you know, I, I would like to think that I um, took one thing from one to the next, but truthfully, I think it was a uh, Bridgewater is a very 
interesting place. I, you know, I think anyone who joins has a little bit of a culture shock. So I would like to think my skills set me up for success, but uh, it was a very new and different environment. Sure. Well, you also did, of course, from Goldman, sort of by definition, learn to talk a lot of the language, which had to help. And so you knew what people were talking about when you heard a lot of these financial terms, even if you didn't directly use them, but it certainly had to help. And uh, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, that when we make choices, we we learn from everything, or we should learn from everything that we do and every choice that we make, and hopefully it builds. And it really does sound like it did sort of build for you going from Goldman to Bridgewater in, in some ways. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Which I mean, makes, they're very different, but every experience yeah. sort of builds on the next. Like, I definitely learned and grew in in, in different – it stretched me in different – ways for sure. Well, being in sales and sales management, which I did for a number of years, and then going into public speaking, uh, they're very different. But the reality is that sales helped me learn to relate to people who I was speaking with into learning how to read people. And sometimes, as, as I tell people, I could speak on any given day to a board of directors down to IT people and so on. And learning to communicate with them definitely helped going into public speaking as well. So again, there are things that you learn that that help you grow. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think even my coaching and sort of sales element now, you learn so much about different people's personalities, how to talk to different people, just the variety of people. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, the sales and the coaching, I feel like the stuff I do today sort of definitely taught me that too. At Goldman or Bridgewater, um, especially at Goldman, did you ever go visit the trading floor? Um, That's a great question. Um, Honestly, I don't know if I did. Um, I I mean, we went to so many different floors for different reasons. Um, You know, there was... um, I don't, I honestly am not. I don't mm-hmm. Well, know. Uh, the reason I ask is you want to talk about crazy places. Trading floors are as crazy as it gets. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, All the yelling I, I and the screaming. It, and I don't think it's the same else. as like what you remember from, you know, the movies and how it used to be. So, so, so hectic, things like that. Um, but uh, I've definitely seen it even just from, I remember I was networking with a mentor of mine who was at a different bank and she brought me to her office. So I've, you know, absolutely been exposed to things like that. But, you know, I would say um, both Goldman and Bridgewater were, you know, intense in in that way that you sort of know what to expect, fast pace. And uh, absolutely, you know, it was uh, that experience. Yeah. Intense is probably a good way to describe it. Um, But they, the, the people who do it, um, and who do it well have have learned and uh, are successful at doing it. So um, that's that's okay too. And um, you know, um, there's I don't think that most people are like um, Michael Douglas in Wall Street, which is okay. <laughs> but um, it, it is an intense environment, and um, and it's it's a fascinating thing to see. I remember after September 11th, we worked with Morgan Stanley to get them back up and running and they had to go find a place to create a new trading floor since the one at the world trade center went away and they found a place in, um, I think it was in Hoboken uh, where they found a room that was literally the size of what they describe as a football field. And within 36 hours, they got equipment from all of the the people they worked with PCs and stuff from IBM uh, tape, magnetic tape, systems from us and so on and other companies. And from Friday night till Sunday afternoon, they worked and they literally were ready to go Monday morning, the 17th, when Wall Street opened again. What a monumental task to be able to do that in 36 hours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Talk about intense. <laughs> but that's uh, <clears throat> the whole point of having data backed up. They were they were ready to go it was just as if Tuesday never happened because it, it it shall shut down before the um well the World Trade Center attacks happened before Wall Street opened. So that was probably a blessing. 
Oh, yeah. Sure. So how long were you at how long were you at Bridgewater? Uh, about a year. Ah. Um, yeah, it's again, pretty intense. Right. And um, yeah, I uh, sort of was ready for for the next thing. Um, but yet again, didn't know what that next thing should be. So actually, I left and I was receiving career coaching. And I started noticing the gaps in what they were doing or providing. And I and I started having ideas as to how I could provide that. And that's when I said, all right, maybe I should lean into this coaching thing. So I um, did training through the NYU School of Professional Studies. They had a diploma program. And then I got certified through the International Coach Federation. And that's when I realized coaching is often conversational. So I started building out some tools. So um, at first, it just started with a career assessment and then uh, more sort of platform-like tools. And now we do have a web-based platform. But I started to build it, build out uh, essentially a shared workspace between the coach and the client um, and, and just advancing and evolving and innovating tools that felt like it would enhance coaching from what I had experienced and what I felt like kind of was missing, um, you know, from my experience. And then I offered the same and started coaching uh, individuals through a variety of different career processes. Um, I started out, I was doing coaching part-time for a few organizations while also building my company. And then I went full-time uh, in my own company in the spring of 2021. And um, the other kind of thing that happened in the mix there was from summer 2018 to 2019, I did a one-year full-time tech MBA program at NYU Stern. So that's when I was actually starting the business while doing the degree. And that was great because I leveraged all of this startup programs at NYU to help me understand how to start a business. Um, so yeah, ever since that, it's been now almost six years of building out um, my coaching company. And what's your company called? Woken. So Woken is a company. Is it, is it, do you have other people or just you? Yes, we have a few other coaches right now. Um, so that's kind of been the recent achievement is making sure that I can train and hire and scale and have other folks. Uh, so now they run the sales calls and, and bring new clients in. And I do still coach some uh, individuals, but the goal is to, to grow and have me hopefully do more of the the innovation. So we always want to advance our digital right. products and make sure that we have newer advanced tools that really it takes the coaching to the next level. So that's hopefully where I can, you know, focus more of and just uh, bringing on more clients and coaches as we grow. Sounds like a plan. So what does Woken stand for? Uh, so, you know, it actually is, I guess, more of just a play on words. I used to always say we are waking up people to take control over their careers. Uh, I think, you know, people often, they do um, take control over their careers, but sometimes, you know, they may not realize that they can or should find and seek support or coaching or resources or guidance. So we're here to remind people that you can and should find a job you love and, you know, our specialty is helping people to clarify their direction because that was really where I lacked support. I spent years trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And now we help other people to do that more efficiently. Um, so yeah, that's our specialty is just making it really practical to get confident on your best fit direction. We also help with making decisions around upskilling, improving your personal branding, job searching, networking, interviewing, promotions, you name it, mindset, accountability, really any kind of career goal or challenge, we sort of co-pilot you through all of that. So what is this, the whole concept of career path exploration? What what exactly does that mean? And, and yeah. how do you move forward with that? Yes. So I try to define this, actually. I mean, that's a phrase that I use. And the definition that I give is it is a step-by-step -step process to learn and reflect. And you're learning about yourself and you're also learning about career path options until you can get confident to understand which path or direction makes the most sense for you to pursue. And that could just be more broadly your path, or it could just mean what's your next step. You always want to be confident to know where do you want to go? before you start job searching. And that's the critical component is ideally this all happens before you start job searching in an ideal world. 
Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of how I define what it is. In an ideal world, but as you experienced yourself, you didn't really do probably nearly as much of that as you wish you had um, when you were in college, did you? Yeah, so that's exactly right. Like, I would look back and I would reverse engineer, like, all right, like, what would have been helpful for me to reflect on at each of these moments? And then I started coming up with frameworks. So, for example, we have a career assessment is broken down into three parts. So it's it's something that I call function content environment. So your function is like, what are you doing day to day, your skills, your affinities? What are those sort of activities you're doing that make up your week? And then the content is really the nature of the work. So what are those problems or topic areas that you find important or interesting? And the third is the environment that you thrive in. So for example, if you're in a role that you're doing sales or research or data or consulting or whatever your role is, you can do those things in virtually any single industry. And so I try to separate those two, which is the functional versus the sector of where you're really applying your skills and the ultimate goal and purpose. And then of course, the environment, what should it look and feel like and the people and the culture and the pace and all the bells and whistles. So I tried it. So that's exactly right. When I looked back at my path, I was kind of like, okay, for example, at Goldman, I liked you know, the functional role, but that industry didn't really align with me, right? So, so you know, I tried to kind of break it up, like what were the components of each experience and how can I help somebody reflect on each of those core pieces? So one of the things that I find really interesting in talking about this whole issue of career path exploration is that it certainly seems like it's something that that people should do. One of the questions that pops into my head is, how much more of that could could colleges do or contribute to making people more successful by doing more of it? Yeah, I mean, I think that colleges um, can definitely do a lot more. I think they don't always know how necessarily, right? Mm-hmm. So we do have some career assessments that are off the shelf. The other element is just getting the college students in the door, right? So we do have career services on campus, but you know, on average is each student walking in once or twice in their college career. And oftentimes they're getting resume help or interview help, right? So it's a combination of we need students to be more engaged and we need on the flip side, the career services to find ways to engage them or have, you know, for example, our software, we would hope in our future is that a career services office could actually use um, you know, the 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 tool that we have to maybe digitally connect a career services counselor with students um, just through technology. So, you know, of course, you know, career services has usually an informational portal or a website, but we want them to be able to really interact even more with their career services counselors because it's one of the most important things. People are questioning the value of college. And really, you know, if you're there to help you figure out your career path, we need to have the tools to make sure that students can do that. Could colleges do more to maybe include internships or on-the-job exploration for people to be able to uh, look at what they might want to do or or not do or decide this doesn't work for me? Or is is that really putting too much of a demand on college because, of course, they're dealing with all the academic stuff? Well, I mean... In an ideal world, like I picture college where it should honestly be 50% internship or work experience and 50% in classroom experience because you learn so much on the job these days. I also think it would help reduce the cost of college and it would help a student earn money from an earlier age, right? We have so many people talking about how some job postings and companies are not even requiring college degrees. So I think sort of an ideal future of college could be work and school all in one. So I agree, you know, definitely internships should be more prominent, but, you know, how many internships can you do? And so what are the odds that you're going to do an internship and that's the career path you should be in? So the process that we guide people through is a more efficient way of learning more comprehensively and more dynamically and more efficiently really is, is the goal, right? Because you have a lot of options and you have to learn about yourself really deeply and you got to compare the two. So that's what our process does in an, an average two to three months, somebody can go through that journey. So internships are great, um, but it may not be the only way to, to figure things out. I've talked to a few people on the podcast 
um, and one I'm thinking of that actually had a program where they worked with industry for high school students yeah. and students would would spend time working and um, it was it's a private school and instead of paying the students because they were studying as high school students, the money went to the school and it actually became one of the major sources of funding for the school. And what they they found is that it greatly increased the percentage of students who graduated and then went on to college, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Yeah, I've seen things like that, too, um, you know, helping high schoolers get that hands on experience, getting exposure to certain paths. All of that is amazing. It just depends. Like sometimes I've seen it be industry specific. So if there's high schoolers getting involved to learn about one industry, right? Is it, you know, what are the odds like that they actually then say that's the industry for me, you know? So these programs are great, but, you know, again, what we try to do is make sure it's holistic and that it's really also self driven so that each individual can explore as many options as they need and narrow in on whatever it is is that's that's right for them. So that's really the idea is hopefully you start broad and then you do narrow in, but you have the ability to learn about whatever it is you need to learn about based on you and your strengths and your interests. That's really what we hope to, you know, allow people to do. So when should people do career path exploration? When do you do it? Yes. So the earlier, the better, right? Um, there's no sooner time than today. Yeah, I thought that's what you'd say. Of course. Um, so, you know, look, I would say anytime you're ready to make a change, if you're going to job search, or even if you're looking to get promoted, you want to know where you want to go and feel good about that. And that way, the getting there is so much easier. So I would say anytime you're ready for a change or a transition, whether it's your first job, your fifth job, your 10th job, any change it warrants the time for you to explore and reflect and figure out what it is you want before you pursue that change. Um, I do think in college or high school, like somebody can pursue these same processes. It's a little harder when you're younger, but you can still absolutely go through it. And the benefit is what we really want to avoid is just like you're picking something, you know, that's, you know, A to Z, you know, very different from what makes sense for you. We want you to get in the right ballpark if you're younger, and that way you can more naturally evolve and organically find the next step that's within the realm of what you've already been doing, right? It doesn't have to be exact or perfect right away. Um, and then, you know, the same goes for later on in your career, uh, you know, it really every time and any time and in people change jobs it could be every one or two or three years that's fine you can do it as often as you need to and usually the first time you go through the the process specifically you get so much clarity but once you do the process like two or three or four times you actually that's really where you get very deep in in terms of like okay now i really know like my personal mission and that that sense of deep purpose and clarity in a bigger way but you know the first few times you do it, it's very practical. Like what is my next step? What it, what makes sense for me in terms of the day to day of this job, right? What is most fitting? And then you really get deeper. Like, as you could tell, I very much know my mission in life. Right. Um, so that's where we want people to get is understanding their true direction. And then what capacity you go act on that could look a lot of ways in terms of types of roles or companies that you could go get involved with. Um, but yeah, you should be doing it really several times, I would say, throughout your your career. You find that there are more people or just that there are a lot of people who demonstrate dissatisfaction with careers and so they just hop from job to job. Um, is yes. that happening more now than it used to, do you think? Or is it yeah, just always I mean, been job hopping used to be that common phrase. And then in the pandemic, it was the great resignation and it was the great rethink. And it was all these phrases to show that people were quitting. They were pivoting. They were ready for a change. They were seeking purpose. They were seeking meaning. I think the pandemic really drove all of that a lot mm -hmm. um, and sort of exacerbated. It gave people opportunities to, to upskill if they were working from home. Like there was a lot of change going on, a lot of readiness for change. Um, these days, you know, when you see a lot of layoffs, 
it's, it can be a stressful time and it just depends on the person, right? If you don't have a lot of runway and you need to find a job quickly, you're going to go after something that relates to your background. If you're ready for a change and you have a little time on your side, you know, you see that people are really going through to do the rethink and, 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 and see what change may make sense for them. But everyone's different. You know, what chapter of your life are you in? What can you afford to do right now? A change, you know, depending on how big that change is may take time and sometimes money to upskill. So, you know, everyone's different in terms of like, you know, what, what they're ready to take on. Um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, statistically, a majority of professionals are in jobs that are misaligned with their personality or in, are they're disengaged at work according to Gallup's definition. So we, we see that it's pervasive. And then, um, I think the, the macro environment, uh, may affect, you know, uh, how, how, and when somebody, uh, you know, uh, makes that a reality for them and, and what they do about it. No matter what we say about the pandemic, it really seems to me that it opened up so many opportunities if we would, but think of it that way. Uh, you're, as you're pointing out, uh, there were a lot of people who pivoted or who thought about pivoting and, and probably really did. Um, and the fact is that, that people started realizing I don't have to just have a job, um, there are other things that I'd rather be doing, or uh, if they really want me to work for them, then what are they going to do to make this a pleasant environment for me? Oh, yeah, exactly. It's a give and take. And it's kind of a, a, an ongoing question of what's reasonable? What should I expect out of an employer? You know, all these all these questions are, are arising again. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because both, you know, you have new... Uh, sort of desires for something better. But at the same time, people look at layoffs and they're like, I should be grateful for sort of any job. So you see everything, you know, people want what they want, but at the same time, no company's perfect either. So you just mm -hmm. have to be able to gauge, is this job, you know, good as it relates to everything else that's out there. And sometimes people don't know how to compare, like, you know, am I in a good spot or am I in a toxic environment? So sometimes that's a lot of what I do is like give perspective, having seen so many situations and, you know, what does that mean for that person? And, and are they ready to move on? Is there a way of making the situation better? Or, you know, maybe they don't realize how good they have it. So, you know, every single person is, is, is different. And, and, you know, I would say step one is just gauging where do you stand, right? How are things going? And, and what are the opportunities for you? Yeah, so often I think we just haven't learned to analyze our environment and learned how to do more introspection and really look at what's happening in our lives. We we react more than we think. Um, and, you know, we could pick on politicians. They're all about reacting and they don't think, but that's another story. But the the fact is that we don't do nearly as much introspection as we should to help us um decide what kind of moves we want to make. Because I'm a firm believer in the fact that in reality, if we really listen to what our mind is telling us all too often, there's a lot of information that's absorbed that can pop out as good decisions, but we go, oh, it can't be that easy. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think at any given time, you know, can you be thoughtful and can you get support for any one decision? But, you know, we can't overthink it. And there's any number of things that you're, you'll only know in hindsight, how did it go? And was this the right call or not? So like, yeah. you know, definitely, I always say like, what's the ratio of like, if this is such a big decision, give it due thought. If it's something that you can easily undo or find another situation later on, like just go for it, you know, but yeah, get get another pair of eyes and ears so you can think through things, but you, you want to be careful not to be overthinking either. Well, but all, you know, even even the simple decisions, it's good to think about them and analyze what we do and <clears throat> what we what we want to do. We just don't tend to think enough about it. We 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 react or we just decide, oh, this isn't good. And you're right. Oftentimes, um, we don't know how good we really have it. And you know, I think about that with the pandemic. I'm used to doing a lot of work remotely. I've been doing it for many years. So the lockdown didn't bother me. But I also know that there are so many people who mm -hmm. were totally 
um, paralyzed by fear and, or as I put it, blinded by fear and not able to really move forward during the pandemic when they were given an opportunity to step back and think about things. It was just, oh, this horrible pandemic. I've got to be in front of people. I got to be with people. Zoom is just a horrible thing to use because I really need to be in front of people rather than looking at all the options that became available to us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it can be overwhelming. There's so many options, so many things available. And that's exactly where a coach can can help. Because part of what I do is just help people make sense of there's so many options for me, right? How do I think through it? And I think the world gets ever more complex, uh, new jobs arising, jobs going away, new technologies, new skills, it's, it's harder and harder to make these decisions. So just getting support through it is is really all you can do. Yeah. Well, um, and it's a participatory thing. So it isn't just all the coach, the, the person being coached has to be an integral part of it. And And, and I think that most of us who at least understand coaching realize that we can mostly only point the way someone has to do the work to to gain something from it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And so it it gets it get it gets to be a, a a real challenge sometimes because people just get so locked into one way of thinking. But yeah, I love I love all the opportunities that have come along. And as I said, even with the pandemic, it offers so many different alternatives if we but think about them. Um, and I think it's been a, a, a pretty good eye-opener in a lot of ways. And I think it's taught companies that there is value in hybrid work that we don't need to necessarily report five days a week, eight or nine or 10 hours a day to the office. People can be very productive on a lot of jobs remotely, at least for part of the time. Personally, I would like to spend some time in a company environment, um, but that doesn't always happen. And as I said, I'm used to working remotely and I've done it for a number of companies for a number of years. So I'm quite used to it. So working at home and now working with Accessibi, uh, where they're eight, 9,000 miles away in Israel, although there's a sales office in New York, but Accessibi's corporation is in Israel. Um, and I'm used to working with them at all hours of the day and night. Thank you very much, depending on whenever they want to have a meeting. Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's so true. I think the pandemic actually just created our ability to work remote. And I think that's a, a blessing because, you know, without it, we, it would have taken at least 10 more years, I think, for the, the workforce to figure it out, like we can all work remote. So that was definitely the silver lining there. But yeah, I mean, how people operate, how teams operate across time zones, all of that is is changing. And, you know, there was definitely a, a hot moment where people were, you know, in interviews, how am I going to talk about my ability to work well remotely, right? So it's definitely an important, but now I think it's such a sort of almost standard for, for, for anyone to have, to, to expect someone to be able to work uh, at least partially remotely. So yeah, um, yeah for sure. Yeah, I know. For me as a, as a public speaker, I like to speak at live events because there are things that I do miss um, as a speaker when I'm doing something remotely. I don't hear all the audience reactions. I don't get some of the information that I get if I'm presenting live. At the same time, um, I know mostly by audiences what I can expect based on what I say. And, and I, uh, I always usually do make some remarks um, to evoke emotional responses um, during a talk. And I don't get to do that in virtual presentations as much. I can make the remarks, but I got to assume how people are behaving because I don't get that information. But I've done it long enough that I'm fairly confident about it. Uh, at the same time, um, doing events virtually also has its value too in terms of how many people can be involved in it. And it's easier for a lot of people to do that. And so I'm glad that we're learning the the value of, of doing virtual work as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It, <laughs> it, it challenges new, new skills, but I think it brings new challenges. There's pros and cons, you know, to the in-person versus virtual. Yeah. So it is a, it is more of a hybrid world than it used to be. Well, What's the process for doing career path exploration in your whole coaching process? What, how do you do it? What do you do exactly? 
Yeah. So we start out um, with an assessment, very open-ended, very reflective. It's People say it's hard in all the best ways. It takes a few hours. Um, and then we narrow in on roles and industries that are relevant to somebody's affinities and reflections. And then we do a little bit of research. So we teach someone how to efficiently research those roles and industries. I think most people get mired down in the research. So we just want to get your feet wet just a little bit. And then we actually teach somebody how to network. So how do you find the right people? How do you reach out to those people, get them to respond? And how do you effectively run an informational chat so that you can deeply understand those roles and industries? Then we sort of go into this like pivot process. So it's sort of like learn, synthesize, reflect, and pivot week over week. And that really helps you to compare, contrast, prioritize your options and narrow in eventually on the best fit role industry and environment, right? It's not to say that you'll never be able to do the second, third choice, but if there's differences between those roles and industries, you want to be able to prioritize which is the best fit for you at this moment in your career. And that that's, that's the goal. That's where we get in the end of the day. How do you know when you're done and you've completed the process? Yes. Um, it's interesting because I think, you know, we go through life with the example of people around us who most people just don't have career clarity. So we think it's normal to like, just never have those answers. But the end of the process is when you feel clear. If you're not yet clear, if you have more questions or concerns or hesitations, that means we either need more information or more reflection or both. So you will get to a point of being informed enough to say, I know enough about this role and I've related how that role relates to me to know that this makes sense for me right now, right? So if there's any open questions, keep learning, keep reflecting, and you will get to that point of saying, I feel good and ready. I'm ready to go pursue this path, whatever it entails, right? And, and having learned what it means to go pursue that path. So yeah, that's kind of when you know that you're done, at least at that moment. Yeah. You So you know it when if you're the person being coached, when you feel you can actually take that step and go into whatever career you've been looking at with the coach. Exactly. Yep. Um, so yeah, I mean, as a coach, I'm listening for somebody to, you know, like I listen to see, are you really clear? Um, I'll ask you like one to 10, how do you feel? Right. Or I'll listen to make sure somebody's like authentically feeling excited and ready versus sometimes, you know, why are you saying that you want to pursue that? Like, I want to make sure that you're really saying it for the right reasons um, and that you're really informed and you're really ready and you feel clear. And then from there, we'll make sure you know the right upskilling opportunities. We'll update your branding materials. We will do job search, all of the next steps from there. But yeah, we first need to make sure, like, are you actually clear, <laughs> right? And And make sure you're ready for the next steps. Have you had situations where somebody didn't succeed or resisted the process? And why was that? What what makes someone not successfully complete the process? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say for the people who see it through to the end, there's always a good end result. Um, because there's only so many ways it can go. There's only so many jobs that exist and you are you and you're limited to your strengths and weaknesses. And of course, you can grow in terms of your strengths as well. But what's your natural affinities? And so when you stick with the process, you know, for enough time and effort, you will always get to that end result. If something doesn't work, it's, you know, people may give up. Um, it does take a little effort and accountability and motivation. It does take time. You know, it's, you know, people, it's tough to do on top of a full-time job. Um, that being said, you can try to make it easy. Like put in 30 minutes a week. You can try to make it manageable for yourself. Um, if, if you feel committed to finding that goal and finding clarity, like you absolutely can find it and should stick with it. But I think sometimes it, you know, the energy and the time or people question themselves and their capabilities, people get nervous and fearful and stressful, right? Or they question themselves, things like that. Your mindset can definitely get in the way. Um, but honestly, if you can stay on track with the efforts and you have a coach to help you work through those mindsets and you're open to getting support through it, you absolutely will get to that end result for sure. So overall, um, if people don't succeed 
is it they're just putting blocks in the way? They don't know what to do. Um, they're resisting what you urge them to think about as a coach or what? Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, let's see, like if there's any sort of mindset blocks, right? It's just a matter of understanding where did that arise for you? Like usually understanding the, like, where did this mindset even begin in the first place? And how do we sort of unravel it? How do we overcome it? How do we alleviate that feeling? And taking the time to work on your mindset. Um, and, and really as a coach, I'm here to listen just to make sure those limiting beliefs aren't getting in your way because, right, you want your your decisions to be grounded in information um, versus, uh, you know, uh, limiting yourself uh, for something that may not need to be the case. So that's really what I'm here to do. But yeah, if you can be open-minded, you can work through your own mindsets, get that support and, you know, put those practical steps in place, you absolutely can successfully, you know, work through the process. If you have one, I'd love to hear, without mentioning names, just a, a real story of someone that yeah. that was a challenge, but ended up being a great success. Yeah. Um, one of my earliest clients, she was a teacher and she really just didn't like the path. Um, that was an understatement. And so we went through the process. She figured out she wanted to be a project manager. Um, we did, or she did the upskilling, you know, PMP certification. We updated all of her branding materials and went through the job search. She landed a job as a project manager. And since then she has grown to be an agile scrum master. Um, I had a different client who was a speech language pathologist and wanted to just move on to something new and different. We went through the process. She realized she wanted to do UX design, did some training around that, upskilling, uh, updated her materials, and she landed at Google in a pretty, um, you know, formal, I think, like two-year apprentice program to train you to be a designer. So those are just two examples of probably big career changers. But to be honest, people come to me and sometimes they need a small change. They just want to look at a new industry or a new size company or maybe a slight pivot in role. So, you know, everyone's different. Those are big examples. Um, but, you know, really for anyone who's kind of like, what do I want? Right. And we don't know the outcome. We don't know if it's going to be a big or small change. But if somebody's in need of that clarity, that's really what the process is for. Do you find there are some people who come to you and they they think they probably are in the right place already, but they're just not sure and you yeah. you go through this process and they go, oh, I was right. This is the right place for me. And it makes them happier and more satisfied on the job. It is sometimes the case. There's usually like one of three areas of improvement. So either role, industry, environment. There's usually a reason they're coming to us if they want to seek some sort of growth. Maybe they're not getting promoted, right? Or maybe they're not developing their skills or, hmm. you know, it could be something like that. So we do just have to diagnose like, what are you seeking? What do you need more of? What are you craving? What are you missing? And it may not have to do with somebody's role. It could have to do with the company, the environment, something like that, right? So fulfillment, you know, can sort of be had in different ways. It could even be industry, right? Are you in a sector that you align with their mission? So we really just need to look at each component and see, you know, what 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 you need help with. Yeah, it still comes down to you got to go through a process, you got to analyze it, you've got to think about it and make some decisions. And um, it's it's all about guiding people to make the decision that really will be best for them. And as you said, you don't know that at the outset. Um, you, you don't even know when you'll have that information. Um, sometimes it's just a breakthrough that suddenly comes to somebody who comes to you for coaching. Exactly. Yep. yep. Which is kind of cool. So do you coach um, all over the world or where do you, where do you get clients from? Yeah, we have coached um, internationally. Uh, I would say largely it's the U S or yeah. even Canada. Um, but yeah, we've definitely helped people uh, Europe and Asia. Um, it, you know, look, sometimes there's a country specific nuances as to their culture or how do they job search and, 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 and unique elements like that. But usually People are aware of what are those nuances, uh, and then they bring that to the conversation. So if there's something specific about, you know, where you live or how it works, we'll incorporate that into your strategy. But, you know, usually it's more about 
what are you really needing help with and the fundamentals of the process? So for job search, are you meeting the right people? Are you getting your foot in the door? Do you know your strategic direction? Are you setting goals? You know, so we really look at the fundamentals of, you know, what do you, what do you need to be doing? Right. And, and where are you at and how can we help? So looking at it from a different point of view, do companies ever come to you and ask you to coach someone or help them with some of the people within their organizations? Yeah, you know, we partner with organizations to do a lot of like events, trainings, webinars, workshops, things like that. We've even done a group coaching series over the course of a few months with a small group. So it just totally depends on, you know, kind of what people need. Um, Ironically, you know, we have people who are currently working, they come to find us on their own. So it's not even like their company Mm -hmm. came to us, but they wanted a coach and maybe their company wasn't providing it. So we're very much kind of like the direct to consumer model. But, you know, in the future, that is something think we're going to uh, look for for more of is just partnering with organizations and um, providing help that way. Yeah, I figured that mostly it was a consumer-oriented model, but I thought it would be interesting to explore the idea of what about companies? Do they value what you do? And, and it sounds like you're you're seeing some of that. Yeah, absolutely. Which is which is kind of cool. So, have you written any books yet about your process and the things that you do? Yes. Um, we you? actually sell that on our website. Uh, that was one of the first things I did. So let's see, back in, I guess, 2018, one of the first things before I had any software or anything like that, I realized I had so many things I had been saying uh, for for years. So I, I wrote it all down and 250 pages later, um, you know, that's uh, that's what we have. So it is a guide. It also comes with our process. So if you're doing the software, you can follow along with the book chapters and things like that. Um, but yeah, that was one of the first. Are you there? Ooh, ooh. Did we lose you? Oh, there we go. My there you go. For some weird reason. Somebody was trying to censor you. I can tell. I know these things. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, if if you, because I don't think we got that, if you'd send me like a picture of the book cover or something, I'd love to put that up to help promote what you're doing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I will Please. Send that over, yeah. Well, um, I've got to say this has been a lot of fun and I, I've learned a lot. I really appreciate your time. Um, if people want to reach out to you um, and maybe learn more about what you do and so on, how do they do that? Yeah. Um, our website is I am um, on LinkedIn. I'm Rachel Serwitz. And that's kind of one of my main places that I post a lot of content. Um, our website has a big free library of career resources, uh, you can email us, team at iamwoken.com. Um, and Woken, by the way, is W-O-K-E-N for those yes. who want to know. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can find, I mean, we're also on every kind of social media site. So you can find us and and reach out, uh, LinkedIn DM, email, whatever it may be. And uh, we, would, we would love to be in touch. And we always offer a free initial call. So 20 minutes and just tell us kind of how you're doing. And we will, of course, give you recommendations. So that's a great way to get started, too. Well, cool. Well, Rachel, I really am grateful for you taking the time to to be here today. And we've been doing this now long enough that it's getting close to dinner time there in New York. So got it. Got to deal with priorities, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, I try to keep that work life balance. So. <laughs> yeah, you got to do that. Well, thank you for being here. And I want to thank you for listening out there. I hope you've enjoyed what Rachel had to say. Please reach out to her. Um, And if you are looking to do something with your career, you can go no further than Rachel to find a um, a great, knowledgeable, I think, very attentive listening person who can help. So please reach out to Rachel and and do that. I'd appreciate it if you would let us know what you think about today. Feel free to email me at michaelhi at accessibi.com. So that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at accessibi, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. Or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhinkson.com slash podcast. And Michael Hinkson is M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N.com slash podcast. And wherever you're listening, please give us a five-star rating. We value those very highly. And we do value your input and your comments. So please don't hesitate to leave them wherever you're listening to us or watching us on YouTube. Love to get those comments. And again, Rachel, one last time, I really appreciate you being here. And thank you for giving us a lot of insights today. 
You are very welcome. We'll talk soon. We will. So thank you.